Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Dia, and I'm an alcoholic. How y'all doing? Really glad to be here. And uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to your meeting, and I want to thank Tyler for sharing. Welcome the new folks, and um, tell you a little about myself, uh, as little as possible, really. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting's being taped, I am not cool. Uh, well, I am from California. The alcoholics are the same there, I want you to know. <laughs> and... Uh, I also am a little uncomfortable, like the first two people who preceded me here, but that's okay. You know, I, I love AA. I have a lot of respect for AA. Uh, I feel I'm an AA success story, actually, and I don't take credit for that, but, but it is true. And uh, I hope, if you're new, that you hear something in my story that would make you feel like maybe Alcoholics Anonymous is the place. Maybe I'm going to come in out of the rain. Maybe I don't have to die a few inches from the door. Like uh, people, I think many of us uh, who've been here, now how the hell did you do this to me? I'm like about to burst into tears. People who I wish were here that aren't here. And, and what happens in AA is we learn. We learn from those who are here, and we learn from those who aren't here. And, um, and I'm grateful to be one of those who are here. And what I'm really here to do is to tell you what you did for me. That, that's what I'm here to do. Wednesday night I went to the Pacific Group meeting and uh, Clancy was my first sponsor and uh, he took his cake for 55 years of sobriety, which is incredible to me. And he's an important person in my sobriety. Uh, he came Thursday night to my Thursday meeting and he shared at the meeting and, uh, you know, we walked out to his car. I, I'm well regarded in the AA where I go to AA and I'm well regarded because the AA I went to taught me how to behave. And as Tyler said, it's hard for me to admit I was wrong. But once the ice cracked, there were just so many things that I was wrong about. Wrong about so much. And the more things I was wrong about, the more I got help in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I could only admit I was wrong because I just felt desperate. You know, uh, I shared last night in a meeting near here, and uh, what I talked about, one thing that has made such a profound impression upon me is um, we say in AA and we say elsewhere, you want to be right or you want to be comfortable. And uh, I reached a point where it was, you want to be right, Sia, or you want to live. And you know, I want to live. That's what I'm doing here. I'm still doing that here. You know, my sobriety date is January 30th, 1983. I, too, have a sponsor, sponsored by Clancy, my first sponsor. And I have a home group. I have these things not because I'm a smart guy, but I have these things because this is what you taught me to do. Uh, this is a thing of survival. We have fun. We were laughing our heads off here, and, and that's really important to me. It's important to me that I take AA very seriously. However, I, I cannot take myself very seriously, and, um, and so that's why I stand up here and tell you my story so you can laugh at me, and I can laugh at me, you know, and, and uh, keep it going that way. And so... Um, you know, I feel great tonight. I feel great to be among you. I feel short. Alcoholics Anonymous made me feel short. Grateful for that. Uh, but yeah, it's a miracle. You know, it's a miracle. And uh, I needed a lot of help when I came here. I, I really did. I am a person who uh, nothing worked out for me right from the gate. I'm a big fat loser. Uh, I don't know what happened. I, I like to say I was born on the doorstep of step one because that's my impression. I just couldn't do a damn thing right, and uh, that includes suicide. I, I, I'm in California, as you know, I'm from there, and uh, when I would have a bad day, I would park under a bridge and wait. You know, we have earthquakes there, and I'd just be, like, optimistic that day. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't have a lot of follow through you know that's a problem <laughs> and um, I don't know if something went wrong when I got here I don't know what the deal was but uh, I just always had a bad bad attitude 
I, I didn't feel a part of anywhere that I was. Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a vocabulary. If you're new here, there's a vocabulary that I understand in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, one thing I came to understand looking back at my life when I got to be among you was that I didn't identify anywhere. I identify here, and I didn't know what that felt like until I did it. I didn't identify in my own family. Uh, they're nice-looking people, the people in my family. And um, what I like to let you know is that I was a tall, skinny thing with buck teeth and scraggly hair in a police report. And uh, so I did not fit in with my family, you know. And um, that upset me. Uh, uh, I went to kindergarten. And uh, kindergarten, it, things got worse in kindergarten. <laughs> I think they helped me out. I was having a hard time with my family. I showed up in kindergarten, and there are these things called people. I don't know what they're for, but there they were. You know? <laughs> and I found them very uh, inconvenient people. They, they were looking at me, and I, I don't know. It's just my nature. I do not think regular people have this reaction to other people, but I just had that, what are you looking at feeling, you know? And um, I felt, as Tyler said, that you were not thinking good things about me. And there were way too many of them to kill, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> we understand, you know, I was stuck. I was just stuck. I hated it. I really hated it. And uh, so I peaked at the age of five, basically. <laughs> and uh, I needed a 12-step call in kindergarten, AA. You were late, you know. And uh, then I lurched into Girl Scouts, and uh, Girl Scouts was memorable because uh, it is the first organization that uninvited me to be a member of an organization that I joined. And uh, Girl Scouts felt upset with me because I did something spurless with the cookie money, and they just didn't appreciate that. <laughs> happened. Oh, and there was this sash thing in Girl Scouts. And I don't know about you, I'm a shortcut type of person. I'm in a hurry here. I don't know where I'm going, probably nowhere, but we're in a hurry, you know. And uh, in Girl Scouts, they had these things called merit badges. Merit would be the clue. But in my case, no, you know, I, I like the way some of them look. And I just started slapping them on that little sash thing, you know. And I was showing up with a lot of merit badges and no cookie money, and it just didn't fly. <laughs> they, they didn't appreciate that at all. And so uh, Girl Scouts uninvited me to be a member of Girl Scouts. And uh, what I mentioned as well is nobody did me the courtesy that day of... Uh, taking me aside and saying, you know, Sia, this is the beginning of a fatal progression. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we see here. And uh, from here on out, every organization that you try to be a part of is going to uninvite you to be a member, which is exactly what happened to me. But, you know, cheer up, because in about 10 years, you're going to become an alcoholic, and you won't give a damn, you know. But... <laughs> Nobody, nobody, nobody there to help, you know. And um, then I grew up in a church, and it was not the church. It was not the church that was the problem. I don't know about you. I've got a lot of stuff in the AA. I, I'm a person with many problems. If you're lacking problems, please come and see me. I'll find one for you. <laughs> Without a program, I am a resentment machine. I am a problems factory. And uh, I, I, I had all these problems, I thought. You know, my family was a problem, and uh, school was a problem, and uh, this church was a problem. I didn't identify in the church either. And uh, I remember, in fact, it was a weird experience in church because I actually did identify with someone in this church, but it was the wrong person. You know, it was like uh, the original lower companion. Uh, there's a story in church, if you're new, it is not religious. But this is a religious story that I was raised on, which is why I bring it up. It was a story about uh, that the world, it was created by a person named God, and it was good. And everybody thought so. You know, it was almost unanimous, except for one person who did not think it was good and who declaimed it high and low, in and out. And I think this person may have been the first alcoholic, possibly. I don't know. All I can tell you is they raised such a ruckus, basically, they were thrown out of the bar. You know what I mean? And they ended up in a place alone. It was called hell. 
And what I felt for this person is like they were the underdog. I kind of felt for this person. And I realized this is not something to discuss with other members of the church. <laughs> that made me feel lonely, you know. And, and it made me feel I was afraid in the church. I had self-centered fear. Like Tyler said, I just felt terrible about myself. And, and I was not to understand until I came to AA. I had a spiritual malady. And, and what is that, you know? And, and if you're new here, I welcome you. Uh, if you uh, have come from treatment, we've been waiting for you. Alcoholics Anonymous loves all alcoholics, you know. And I've come to see AA as what I see it as is kind of a spiritual hospital. I see it as many things, but that's one thing. And it is a weird hospital because it is a place where I think the patient must die for the alcoholic to live. Who is the patient? And I think the patient is my ego. I think that is where in the alcoholic the malady resides. I mean, maybe you're sitting on it. I don't know. If that is true, it's much smaller now, so that's good, you know. But in my case, it, it, it centers in the mind, the book says, and, uh, and, and this ego is the problem for me. It is the burglar of my life. My ego is ferocious. It's macho. My ego has a mustache, I think. You know. <laughs> and uh, I, I led this ego-feeding proposition kind of life. This is what AA calls it. Basically, what I'm telling you is I was a liar, liar pants on fire. And uh, I, I would color life the way I wanted to see it. And the way that I wanted to see it was how it related to me. Because part of my illness is self-centeredness. That whatever you do, must have some component of me in it. And if it doesn't, well, that hurts my feelings, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it's just how I am. I, I'm a, you just can't win with me. I remember one of the relationships I had. This guy said to me, I think you're the angriest person I ever met. To which I replied, that makes me angry. <laughs> That's it, you know. I, I'm a divisive person against myself. I, I will argue with the ambulance driver about the route, you know. I, I over-like people who under-like me, you know. And, uh, of course, my all-time favorite when I think of myself in this regard is I, I can't wait to meet the next guy down the road to fall in love, apparently, so I can start hating his guts as soon as possible. <laughs> You know, so uh, I get nowhere. I get nowhere. And what I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous, all these geographics I would take, the only genuine geographic for an alcoholic of my type is out of self. And it is only in Alcoholics Anonymous that I found that door. It is the spiritual program. And so I, I brought this, this spiritual malady in here in the shape of my ego and... Uh, you all do the steps with me. As Tyler mentioned, you do the spiritual autopsy, steps four and five, and with a sponsor, which is so important, because what Alcoholics Anonymous is, I let an ego-feeding proposition type of life, and I come in AA, and it's an ego-puncturing experience, and that is uncomfortable, and I do not like to be uncomfortable. Please do not do that to me, you know. And I'll kill you. I'll kill your whole family. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you need a sponsor. You need a sponsor. You know, someone to translate the value of it, that there's something to get out of it. And the book says, you know, pain is the touchstone of progress. And, and, uh, and uh, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, well, I need a SWAT team to kind of hold me in place. But uh, and, and so I go through this autopsy with my sponsor to help me understand cause of death, because spiritual bankruptcy is a type of death. And uh, and one of the geographics I took was suicide. I just wasn't good at it, and I'm very lucky. And and you help me understand that pride, envy, greed, lust, anger, gluttony, sloth, these are all symptoms of my spiritual malady and tools of my ego. And if I do this thing right, with your help, what happens at the end of that is I have a spiritual awakening. And then what I find out is that uh, I have been working on the wrong problem my whole life. I don't know anything more hopeless than that. I thought you were my problem. You, my parents. You, my employer. You, my boyfriend. 
you, the purveyor of all the things. And, and I never understood the problem is within, you know. And uh, I wish there was a DNR on the chart of my ego. Unfortunately, <laughs> the ego resuscitates itself. It's very selfish. <laughs> and uh, I, I have never had any friendly direction from my ego. It is the most incredible case of mistaken identity on my part. My ego will do things like... My hero, my ego, you know, stand back, I'll handle this. And the next thing you know, I've been fired. Or I end up single again. Or, I don't know, you know, the cops are at the door. And, uh, it, and it's nowhere to be found then. And the weird thing about this illness for me is the ego isn't divisible. You know, I can't put it in a shoebox and go out in the world. It comes along with me. And if you're new, really what would be best for me, I don't know about you, is that my ego have no personal information, no numbers, you know, because it uses them against me. My ego, I'm too tall to live, just ask my ego. I'm a loser because my ego knows how much money's in my bank account. You know, and it goes on and on and on. And I was talking uh, at the break with somebody about that. It's the fishwife. It's, it's the general leading me into battle where there's nowhere to fight, there's no bullets, and I'm bumbling along behind, you know. My ego was my higher power. I didn't understand that. Alcohol was my higher power when I came here. But when, you know, I'm like an island surrounded by a sea of alcohol. And when the alcohol subsides, what do you have there? Between me and you and me and God is this minefield, my ego. And the tripwires are all those defects of character. And so what am I to do about that, you know? And I didn't even have this information. This information is in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and when I work with people in the program and talk to you in the meetings, the most casual of conversations, it makes the program come alive for me. That big book, I say it's my autobiography. Before I, before I ever got my hands on that book, I was cramming it down my throat one page at a time, a chaser for every drink I took. And you know, the end of the story is an open ending. It can be a tragedy or it can be a success story through Alcoholics Anonymous. And as of today, I do feel like a success story. I do feel capable of thanking you and telling you what you did for me, you know. And, uh, and so the church didn't work out, in short. <laughs> the church did not work out. And, and I used to blame the church. And uh, I remember somebody in AA, because we teach each other here. Because I'm not a charity case, and neither are you if you're new. It's one alcoholic talking to another. We're on an even playing field here. And that gave me a great deal of dignity when I came back here. And uh, somebody came up to me and said, you know, I was saying something against the church, and they said, you know, Sia, I am in that church. I'm a member of that church, and that's offensive to me. And I want to thank that person, because what it taught me is I don't use the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous for things like that. Because if somebody knew is in the meeting and practices that religion, I could turn them off. And that could be a death sentence. I don't want any part in that. I want to carry the message of AA to the best of my ability. I mean, I'm human, but there it is. And... Um, and I remember thinking that I had lots of problems, as I said, and, and uh, there are women that I work the program with, and it's a privilege, and they come in with old ideas, and I had many, and they talk about uh, boundaries. And, and the funny thing to me about boundaries is, you know, the worst enemy is already within your boundary. My ego's right here, right here. It knows all about it. I don't have to keep the other people out. The other people are not the problem. My parents were not the problem. It was my reaction to them that was my problem. The guy down the street that had a sexual problem and got a hold of me a few times, that's not my problem. My reaction to it was my problem. I remember coming in AA and I'm a very, I had trust issues is what I said, which makes me laugh like a hyena, I gotta tell you. Because you know what I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous? The most dangerous person in my life today is me without a program. It's always me. I'm the person who killed myself. I'm the person who, well, it's a mixed meeting, but you know, listen, I dated men with open psychiatric files, okay? I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just exciting. <laughs> I slept with goblins, okay? <laughs> I remember waking up a couple times. I mean, this didn't happen often, but since I'm going down this road, I, I woke up a couple times, and I remember thinking, I wonder maybe, 
maybe I should call the zoo, because if they're missing anybody, I might know where they are. <laughs> it, it, this is a terrible life, and I don't have to live like that anymore, and neither do you. And maybe your particular that is different from my that, but you just don't have to live that way anymore. And it's the thing that you wake up with, that duel at dawn. You know, it was with the drink, and it was with all the things that went with the drink. But uh, I had my first drink when I was 17 or 18. And I remember taking that drink with some trepidation because I had grown up in a home where alcoholism was a problem. I mentioned to you I felt my parents were a problem. And uh, my father had a drinking problem. My father said he was alcoholic, so I will say he's alcoholic. I try not to call anyone alcoholic unless they themselves say so because that's the dignity Alcoholics Anonymous gave to me. If I say I'm alcoholic, okay. You know, and the other part of that that's an interesting thing with a person like me who has faulty dependency is if I say it, then I'm responsible for my own recovery with your assistance. And, and so my father was an alcoholic, and it's a family illness, we say, in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, my father lost his standing in the community. We lived in a small town in Montana, and um, people talked about my dad. And I heard it, and I hated him. And, uh, and I hated my dad. And I remember he lost most of his worldly possessions, and the family went with him, you know. And so when I took that drink, I remember thinking, uh, I wonder if I'm going to lose everything or if I'm going to end up like my dad or something. And, and I was careful, and yet nothing seemed to happen. But here is what did happen. We talk in AA about the effect produced, you know, and uh, the effect produced was such a subtle thing that I didn't even notice it. I, I believe I was born with a spiritual malady. I believe I was born alcoholic. You couldn't have been able to tell that by smelling my breath, but it was this attitude I had, and it's this way that I think. And uh, I had this obsession of the mind of not fitting in, not identifying. I had this, the book talks about alcoholics. Some of us are terribly lonely. We're haunted by loneliness. And I was a person like that. And perhaps you would have described yourself in that way. And, and I had this drink. And you know what? I wasn't worried about fitting in. I didn't care about being a part of. That was like gone. Just bam. Just like that, it was a great feeling. It made me want to stay up for the rest of my life just to march around the planet and feel that feeling, you know, a new freedom and a new happiness. And uh, naturally, if you get a feeling like that and a release like that, you're going to go back to that again and again, and I did. I started drinking as often as I could, and... Uh, there are reservations in Montana, and I could drink on the reservations in the way that I wanted to drink. There were no repercussions, and, and I don't mean anything against anyone who lived on a reservation if you did. It was just that I could be there, and I hadn't any, uh, like, the morning after people kind of reprisals. And uh, I started taking geographics. I am somebody who does that. And then I quickly started having this thing called assistive geographics, which I mentioned as well last night. I named it because it started happening to me a lot. And assistive geographic is where people start helping you pack before you're ready to leave. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first uh, sister geographic was my mom. My mom packed me up and made me leave because uh, I came home and I was in a bad mood and uh, my brother had something to say to me about my behavior or arrival time. I don't know. We got in a fist fight and my mom caught between us and uh, something I didn't understand, which I mention when I speak because it indicates to me my own self-centeredness is that my mom and my father had separated, and uh, as Tyler mentioned, what I didn't understand was that my mother's life, probably she felt like her life was over. You know, it's a small town, and she had all these kids, and they were separated, and, and, and she just couldn't take me on, you know, and so my mom packed me up, and I had to leave. And uh, I took a geographic. I went to California. You know, it's interesting to me. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. I, I thought, if you're new, I grappled with this idea of God. You know, when I came into AA, I felt so subjugated by the idea of God based on my experience in this particular church. And I said to myself, you can't see God anyway. And what is funny to me about that is this. I, I never saw any other person, really. I didn't see you. You were a means to an end. If you were a guy, I meant to burn the numbers off your credit card, you know, if at all possible. And, and I just approached people as a means to an end. I had a cash register part. And uh, uh, I remember Clancy sending me to the doctor at some point. 
I guess he wanted to see if I still had a, a brain because I sold a lot of other things while I was out there, you know. But but I I just had this approach to folks, and uh, and so I uh, just lost my train of thought. The, the the so the thing is I didn't see people, and I and and this idea of God. This being subjugated by God. I came in AA and I found out that we approach God differently in AA if you're new and you're concerned about that or frightened of that. I was frightened of it. You know, I felt like the God of my understanding was looking for me and had a lightning bolt with my name on it. I was like the most smotable person you might meet. <laughs> how I felt. And I, I was scared, you know. And uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, we pray different. Alcoholics Anonymous, you come to a meeting, that's a prayer. In Alcoholics Anonymous, you call your sponsor, that's a prayer to me. You know, we pray different here, and, and God is a higher power here. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, it can be whatever you want it to be. But the simple principle here is it's something that helps. God is something that helps. And other than that, in Alcoholics Anonymous, God's anonymous, just like all of us, you know. And I find that an amazing, that was a life-saving thing for me. And the interesting thing as well is no matter who your God is and who my God is, we're all looking for our God or our higher power, or he, she, it, whatever you call it, to do the same thing. I don't want to drink today, and I am unable to make that choice. That is how I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, and so in any case, I, I had this drink. I had that release. I started having consequences, as Tyler mentioned. And I ended up in California. And um, I started drinking in Beverly Hills. And I remember that because that's what I said to myself. That's a sales job. That's called whistling in the dark, if you're new. That's in the book. Because I was telling myself everything was okay. I was already doing that. And things were not okay. And things got worse. I, I quickly ended up drinking way, way out of Beverly Hills, way down at this place, way past Western, if you know Los Angeles, in a rather unsavory neighborhood, I guess. And uh, the place where I drank was called The Good Night, but I would like to assure you, it was not. And um, I drank there with another young woman, not as a friend, but she was there. We probably had no business being in that bar, but I could drink in that bar like I drank on the reservation. And uh, what happened was that eventually, not too long after that, one of us ended up with our head blown off behind this establishment. And I don't know why it was Debbie, and I don't know why it wasn't me. I had a mouth on me when I drank, and so did she. And I don't know. It was uh, it was a terrible thing to me, and it frightened me. And um, I don't know what your drinking might have looked like. Mine didn't include that kind of violence normally, and uh, and it got my attention. It felt very close to home. And what it made me do was start trying to control my drinking. I had not tried to control my drinking before. If you had a problem with my drinking, you know, sayonara, pal. You know, that's the price I would pay for my drinking. I need to drink. I don't need you. And I started to try to control my drinking, and I was shocked to find I was unable to do that. I, I thought, you know, you wise up here. You know, quit hanging out there. And, and I found myself unable to do it. And I started, at that point, drinking behind my own back is how I see it. And, and without my permission, you know. And, and you start to go, like, what's going on here? And, and my life started marching on without me. And it was a very terrifying feeling. And, uh, and, and that's an unnatural thing to happen. And that's alcoholism is what that is. Allergy of the body. I have an allergy of the body. And I have other allergies besides alcohol. I have an allergy to penicillin, but I'll tell you this, I'm never going to go out and score myself a shot of penicillin. <laughs> and, and the difference between that allergy and alcoholism is the other part, obsession of the mind. And I had obsession of the mind. We had a new woman in my Monday meeting at uh, my place of work, and she'd been trying to fight this obsession. She'd gotten like 364 days. You could see it in her eyes. You know, She said, it's the craving. It's the craving. It just keeps coming back. It makes you crazy. And I thought, God damn, pardon me. I, I know what you mean. I knew what she meant. You know, it lives in you, and you have no choice anymore. And uh, and so I started kind of looking for help because I couldn't stop drinking. I got burglarized during this time, and I remember I didn't even notice for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I started saying, who lives like this? You know, I just was... I couldn't stand myself, as Tyler said, and I didn't know any way out. And uh, the capper was this. I looked out the window casually one day and uh, happened to notice a guy walking down the street. And this is in Los Angeles proper, and he was carrying a shotgun. 
I thought that was pretty remarkable, actually. And um, what is interesting is it's lucky that I noticed it, because the guy across the street came into the courtyard of the building where I lived and up the stairs into my door. And because I had seen him with the shotgun, I didn't open the door when he knocked. But I didn't know who he was. And, you know, this is what happens when I drink. I, I do things in blackouts, and there's consequences later. And people are upset with me, and I, I hang out with lower companions. And they probably would have said to you I was the lower companion. But at that moment, I stood on this side of the door, and he was on that side. And I wondered if he discharged the weapon, if it could go through the door and kill me. I didn't know. That's where my life got to at that point. And uh, I got a break that night. Uh, because I guess it was just too much trouble for him, and he turned around and he walked away, you know, and uh, and uh, I was really looking for help now, you know, and, and what happened was like a day or two later, I was looking through the newspaper, just lost, and there was a thing about Alcoholics Anonymous. It said in the community service section that people in AA meet in this place, and they hold hands, and they pray, and then they don't drink anymore. And I bet you I thought that was so corny, because I was cool, too, for about two and a half minutes one time in 1841. And <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that quickly followed is, I want to go. You know, I want to go. Something in me spoke. Something in me wanted to live. And I went to an AA meeting, and um, it was a good meeting. It was a daytime meeting. I say it was a good meeting because somebody greeted me. You know, you were friendly to me when I came here. Thank you for having me. You know, I've been worried about this for months because it's like this one night, second night, third night, and I thought, oh, man, this is terrible. Because if I mess up the first night, then they're stuck with me, like, for three nights, and I was just, like, freaked out. So I'm grateful I'm doing this finally, you know. But anyway, uh, I uh, walked in this meeting, and this woman gave me her phone number, and she said she'd sponsor me, and I didn't want uh, Whatever you were selling, I didn't want it. I wanted the thing that the papers did, you know. And I, I sat down through the meeting. I don't know how long the meeting was, and I waited for the prayer. That brings tears to my eyes. I waited until the end of the meeting, and then we did the thing. I didn't know the steps. I didn't know the traditions. I didn't have the book. You know, it's not like you deserve it here. It's just you're given it. And I, and I wanted help. You know why I believe in God? Because I need God. You know why I even tried? Because you're here. You can't stop drinking. Somebody stands up at a podium like this so generously, just talks about it, you know, like what happened to him. And I know you couldn't stop drinking either. And you're not drinking. How'd you do it, you know? And that's what I wanted. I wanted that. If I had to steal it, I don't know. And I walked out of that meeting, and like an hour later, bam, again, just like the first time I drank, it was gone. That monkey on my back was gone. And I remember thinking, maybe this is what people mean by God. You know, I had an experience of God, and, 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 and that was the word that I used. And if you don't want to use that word, if you're new, okay. But it was something. And I've been looking over my shoulder ever since, you know. And uh, there was this great guy, Chuck C., on my side of town, California, you know, and he got sober, and he wrote a book, A New Pair of Glasses. And I knew what he meant there. I got a new pair of glasses. But you know what I did? I stepped on him, like everything else that was good in my life. Because here's what happened to me. I didn't have the book. I didn't engage with you. I thought I had a drinking problem. I didn't know it was alcoholism. My problem was solved. You know, that craving, it was gone. And I did something like, hey, if something comes up, I'll be right back. Because that's how I operate, you know. And unfortunately, about two weeks later, something came up. And what came up is I got a resentment. That sounds like nothing, does it? But here's the thing. If you're new, the book talks about resentment. This is the spiritual part of my malady. This is the obsession of the mind part of the malady. I got this resentment, and uh, the book says that it kills more alcoholics than most other things or something like that. It's the number one offender. That's a pretty dramatic thing to say. And uh, I, I should be the poster child for that, because what happened to me, I had like two weeks of the greatest. It, it was just great. I was so happy, leaping out of bed in the morning. I got this resentment, and what happened is I drank. So the other person was probably fine. I drank. And, and you know what I understand now? Resentment is being willing to die over somebody else's problem. Because that was that guy's problem, and I reacted to it, and I drank. And uh, this is what you said to me in AA right along. You know, I had this feeling like, oh, yeah, my part, 
you know, I felt like my part. And if you got no part in something, I felt like I had no part. And you said to me, that's why you're nothing with a hole in it, Sia. If you have no part in anything that happened in your life, then I guess there's nobody there. That's a total lack of self-worth, and I had never understood that. And I brought to you these things like my dad and that guy on the neighborhood and my mother. My mother had a nervous breakdown when I was a kid. You know, that's a terrible mother, a lunatic for a mother, an alcoholic for a father, and the guy down the street, you know, what do you mean my part? And here's what Alcoholics Anonymous did with me. Here's what you said to me. You said, your part, Sia, is let it go. You don't have to be defined by the limits of any other person. Alcoholics Anonymous will set you free from the bondage of self. Let it go and allow yourself to become whatever your higher power would allow you to be. You know, why do you think, if you're new here and you hate your guts, the mojo that's given to me to live without the obsession to drink, there's something great to do. There's a pony under here somewhere, you know, as you're shoveling the S-H-I-T. And, and, and it's true. Alcoholics Anonymous is true. It's true. What the book says manifests. It manifests in the meeting. It manifests in the members. If it doesn't manifest, it's a goddamn lie. And it does manifest. I see it in your life. I see it in my life. You know, uh, I lost my family because of my drinking. I got my family back because of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't even want my family back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just, <laughs> you know, I I drank without my permission. Alcoholics Anonymous works without my permission. It is a very strange thing, a spiritual program. I think I. I'm building my house over here. You know, I start trying to manage it, and I go to bed, and I wake up, and it's over there. And I do that what the hell thing, you know. And then I find out it should have been there all the time. And you slowly, <laughs> slowly let go. You let go of the results, and these beautiful things start to happen. And 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 so uh, I drank again, and I was out there for a long time. And here's my point, because I, I want to say a few things about Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, Lack of power was my dilemma. And, and lack of power to do what if you're new? I, I couldn't stop drinking. There's the fundamental example. And there are times when I'm going through life and I have a tough time. Life may not go my way. You know, what happens is my ego asserts itself. And my ego gets bigger than my program many days. And that is why I have a sponsor. And that is why I have conscious contact. That is why that is the most important thing in my life, is a conscious contact with a power greater than myself. It's not a religious thing if you're new. It's a survival thing. Because the minute I get a resentment, or the minute I get any of the other defects going in my life, I've lost my conscious contact, and I'm in obsession of the mind, and that's the realm of the ego. And, you know, that's when I have to say, sorry, employer, I can't come to work today. Because what happens is I get an attack of self-centered fear, and the book says self-centered fear activates all our defects of character. And I guess it has, like, opposable thumbs or something. Because then it goes through the zoo of defects, and it opens up all the doors, and all the defects get out, and then I'm, like, fighting for my life. Sorry, employer, can't come to work today. Sorry, mom, can't help you out. Sorry, kids. Sorry, person in the relationship. And you know, my whole life goes to hell. Uh, or I can work a God-reliant program. And, and I have found that means specific things to me. And what it means to you will be different. You'll be the person who decides if you're new. And, uh, and so I started this journey. What happened is that I ended up coming here because I don't have a whole lot of time left. I, I ended up coming here from London. I was in London. I'd taken a geographic there. I said I was a model. I doubt you would have called me that if you'd seen what I was doing. And um, <laughs> I went back to AA. I got mad at AA. I decided it's time for a geographic. And it says, there's one who has all power. May you find him now. And like Tyler, what I found that day, his name was Gerald, you know. <laughs> <laughs> old Gerald Mayer at Gatwick Airport, and he's getting us out of the country, and what happened is that he was arrested right in front of me. I picked the winner again, you know, and uh, and he was taken away, and the tickets were taken into custody. It's that thing we read at the beginning of the meeting, take a trip, not take a trip. And, uh, and, and so what I did, because I didn't have plan B, is um, I ruined my sobriety. And, and then I did an interesting thing. I went back to a meeting in London, and there was somebody there from America, 
and I talked to them for a minute, and they gave me a phone number, and it was Clancy. And I called, and then he said, you know, if you want to clean up your act, maybe maybe we can help you. And, and I felt so bad. If you're new here and you feel bad, I'm sorry. That's very uncomfortable. But it's an important building block in Alcoholics Anonymous. A spiritual program is such a paradox. Because there's things that work in here that don't work out there. All my life, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't stay in Girl Scouts. I wasn't welcome in the church. I wasn't feeling welcome in my family. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. I walk in AA, I still can't. I can't stop drinking. And another alcoholic turns to me and says, I can't either, Sia. You know, but that's step one, if you're new. I can't. That's the shorthand I was taught. And then you said to me, but step two is we can. And when you're ready, if you're ever ready or if you ever want to, it's God, as you understand God that can. And step three is simply let him. And I wake up every morning in I can't. That's never changed. I've never changed. It's the overlay of power that has changed me. And and so... I got on the plane and I came here. You know, I got sober in the Pacific group, one alcoholic yelling at another. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, match made in heaven, you know. They really, uh, I, I hated them, and they were exactly what I needed. It was an ego puncturing experience, and the reason it worked is I had nowhere else to go. And that was that was like a combination of things. I'm in the I can't club. You know, and, and so if you're new and you're uncomfortable, that's a helpful thing. I, I paid attention because I felt like I might be dying, you know. And, and when I was given no way out, I took this coffee commitment that night. And that was such a weird experience. You know, somebody gave me a ride to the meeting there, and somebody put me up. They were, like, great to me. And I got to the meeting, and it was a big meeting, bigger than this. And then I got terrified. I'm afraid of people without a program. And I thought, I want out of here. They didn't look like alcoholics to me. I look like an alcoholic because I'm in here looking out, you know, comparing my insides to your outside. And uh, I didn't have a ride home. So I sat in the meeting, and at the end of the meeting, this guy came rushing up to give me a coffee commitment. That's probably exactly what you do here. And I didn't want that coffee commitment. I bet that doesn't surprise you. And uh, <laughs> I said to this guy, I couldn't take it. I said, I'm only going to be here two weeks. And that is an interesting thing to have heard myself say because, you know, my resume that that night, I told you my family disowned me. I'd lost my job from drinking. I'd been uninvited to one entire country at that point. <laughs> I had a lot of stuff wrong, and the thing that bothered me the most is I happened to be married to two people at the same time. <laughs> That's embarrassing, you know. It's hard to explain. It's like, what'd you do? Lose count? Not a high number. One, two. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Just leave me alone. And, uh, and so I I said to this guy, I can't take the coffee commitment. I'm only going to be here two weeks. And without missing the beat, he said, okay, take it for two weeks. And you know I didn't have a lie quick enough. <laughs> and I guess what I want to ask you if you're new is, does that look like anything at all? Because it felt like the end of the world to me. And what I didn't understand is that's like a really important transaction in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a spiritual transaction. And what it was is that it was a surrender. It was a surrender. That's the unicorn in Alcoholics Anonymous, I think. The $100 word. I just couldn't, I couldn't find one more lie in my hip pocket. Couldn't think of anywhere else to go to propel myself out of it. Lack of power was my dilemma, and that was a gift, you know. And, and so what it is is like I think of that like one time when I was almost drowning. I'm an excellent swimmer, and I underestimated the situation just like I underestimated my drinking. And uh, I remember I fought, and I fought, and I fought this drowning. And that's what you do. It's instinctive. And then there's just nothing left. You got nothing left, and you just float away. I was just floating. And then suddenly this very weird thing happened. There was something to stand on. I had nothing to stand on moments before. I could stand on something, and I got my head above the water. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous feels like to me. Out of nowhere, the most unlikely of things, it seemed, because that's where I live. It ain't going to work. That's my spiritual address. You know I know where God is if you're looking for God if you're new. I'll tell you where God is. God is in the drunk. God is in no way to stop drinking. God's in terror. God's in death. God's in nowhere to go. That has to be true, because that was my spiritual GPS when I came here. And, and I got my head above water in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I started on this journey with you. And uh, 
I've been here for a little while now, and I've come slowly to some things in AA. There's a lot to learn if you're new here in AA, and, and a sponsor is an important part of that. To be somebody I can go to, continuity. You know, my sponsor said to me, Sia, if you drink again, I will not sponsor you. And if you try to kill yourself, I will not sponsor you. And because that sponsor is so important to me, that's held me off a few times when I thought about it. You know, there's not a back door for me in Alcoholics Anonymous. This really isn't my life anymore. God's my employer. This is God's life. And, and I have come to that. If that's not comfortable, if you're new, that's fine. This is just my program. And I remember something I want to mention because I so much respect what this group stands for, singleness of purpose. I didn't particularly feel one way or the other about it. And I heard that there are places that don't go for that. And uh, I was on the fence briefly about that. And then an interesting thing happened that helped me understand the value of singleness of purpose. I got cancer. And uh, what does that have to do with singleness of purpose? I don't know, but it made me think about something. And it, and it was a pre-cancer diagnosis. That's not so bad, is it? And I remember going to, to be uh, treated for this, and I started thinking about it, and I thought, okay, this was, for the sake of my privacy, I'll just say it was a female-related cancer. And I thought, I wonder if I showed up if, with my cancer, if they were going to treat me for prostate cancer. I wonder if I'd say to myself, well, it's all cancer. It's all the same thing, right? I don't think I would. And then I thought a little further about it. And I thought, you know, let's say that I had breast cancer and they were going to treat me for ovarian cancer. I don't really think even then that I would say to myself, well, it's all the same thing. It's all cancer, you know? And then the other thing that I thought about it, if you're new, is I thought, <coughs> and while I was being treated for the wrong cancer, my cancer would be progressing. And I will tell you that in the time I've been sober, there have been many, many times I have underestimated my alcoholism. I have still treated it in spite of all the things the book says as a drinking problem. This is a problem that is an allergy of the body and an obsession of the mind. And all those defects of character are aspects of obsession of the mind for an alcoholic of my type. What is resentment? It's anger plus obsession of the mind. What is gluttony? I, I am a recovered bulimic as well. Gluttony is bulimia. Gluttony is obsession of the mind plus some... You go right down the line, and, and that's the spiritual malady. There is something different about the alcoholic, and you have helped me prosper, and you paid that 12-step call upon me, and uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.